Kia ora koutou. Welcome to the Talians Legal Tech webinar series. My name is Wayne Rumbles, Associate Professor at Te Piringa Faculty of Law at the University of Waikato. I am the project leader of the Technology and Legal Education for New Zealand project, or Talians, funded by the New Zealand Law Foundation as part of the Information, Law and Policy project. Technological developments do and will continue to raise issues and challenges for government, business and civil society and have implications for both legal education and legal practice. The law faculties are in a strong position to prepare law graduates for legal practice and IT driven changes now and into the future. The vision for the project is that all law students in New Zealand are exposed to technology and legal innovation throughout the core law curriculum. To achieve this vision, Talens has teamed up with academics from across the six New Zealand law schools to build greater digital capacity and to develop a set of tools and resources that any academic can use to integrate technology and the impact of technology into their core law courses. The project has three strands, the creation of teaching resources and the development of New Zealand specific research in the area of legal tech and thirdly, the creation of networks and dialogue between academics, practice and tech providers, both nationally and internationally. Today, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Talians Legal Tech webinar series. Hey, thanks, Wayne. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, morena, and uh, uh, welcome to this morning's, um, it's still the morning, yep, yeah, this morning's session, this Talian seminar. Um, uh, my name's John Hopkins. Um, I call John Hopkins a whole. I'm a professor down here at Canterbury. I actually work primarily in law and disasters. I'm a public lawyer, but I also work in uh, in this field as well, law and technology, and I'm on the board with uh, with Wayne of this project. Um, but I know uh, I'm I'm fascinated by the subject of e-voting, although I know very little. So I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, looking forward to being educated uh, this morning. So we have three great panelists. Um, uh, who and I've managed to lose the notes. There we go. We have, sorry, uh, we have uh, Professor, Associate Professor Vanessa Teague from uh, ANU who, and uh, also CEO of Thinking Cybersecurity. She'll be up first. Then we've got uh, Dr. Julian Molyneux, who's a, uh, Julianne, excuse me, uh, Molyneux, who's a, a lecturer in uh, New Zealand politics at AUT. And then finally, we've got Graham Ed Edgeler, who is a barrister in Wellington with um, experience in electoral law. So um, we don't have a lot of time, so I think um, rather than hear me rambling on, you'd rather hear from our speakers. So if, uh, if everybody is ready, I think I'll turn over to Vanessa, who will start us off on today's topic. I'll, I'll let you introduce your topic, Vanessa. Okay, thank you. I'm a, a cryptographer from Australia, so I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a New Zealander, but I'd like to share some experiences about e-voting security from some of my uh, research in particularly in Switzerland and New South Wales. And the, the main thesis of my talk is going to be that uh, good electoral law really, really matters, especially in this context. I don't think secure internet voting is a solved problem, technically. And I'm not expecting good laws to magically solve that problem. That's not what we expect law to do. But I think good laws can make all the difference for prohibiting or preventing really bad things from happening. So here are some stories, some contrasting stories from Switzerland and New South Wales. So first of all, let's just have a think about what kinds of things we're talking about when we're talking about internet voting. It's really a lot more like proxy voting than like filling in your own vote on a piece of paper. And what you're really doing is you're asking an electronic system to cast a vote that you have politely asked them to cast, but you don't necessarily get any kind of direct representation of what your vote is, and you don't get any natural way for scrutineers to stand around and watch the piece of paper going through the electoral process and checking that everything is fine. So I think if more people thought of it as proxy voting, it would seem like much less obviously such a good idea. And there'd be a lot more focus on asking who's, who are you handing your proxy to? Who has the opportunity to read it? Who has the opportunity to change it? And how can you verify that they're doing the right thing? So the cryptographic literature, which is really my corner of the world, has spent years and years and years looking at fancy mathematical techniques for being able to verify 
that the electronic system you're trusting with your vote really has done what you asked it to do and recorded your vote accurately, transferred your vote accurately into the count and counted it properly at the end. So here's one picture of how that might work, right? This is kind of, this is not any particular system. This is just sort of meant to be a generic system from the cryptography literature, looking at the way that an electronic voting system might work if we were going to try to enhance it with evidence that it was doing the right thing at each point. So on the far left, we have voters voting presumably on their own device from home and are somehow interacting with the system in a way that gives them a proof that the their client recorded their vote honestly. And that's really hard actually, because you can't actually tell what vote your computer is recording for you, particularly if you didn't write the software, you're not sure whether there's other malware on your machine or some other things going on. Then at, in the middle of the thing, we have a public bulletin board, which is a public list of all the encrypted votes. And everybody's supposed to be able to check that their vote is there. And then on the right hand side, we have a series of shuffling and decryption services, which are supposed to break, rearrange the votes, break the links between who uploaded which encrypted vote and what decrypted vote comes out at the other end. And obviously it's really important for those mixing and shuffling services to provide a proof that they've done that thing honestly because otherwise there's an opportunity for them to perform substitutions, to lie about what votes the, uh, to lie about the decryption of the votes or to simply add or remove votes as they go. So there's a huge academic literature in the crypto community about efficient verifiable proofs that you've shuffled a list of encrypted votes and decrypted them properly. So here's a little picture of what that's supposed to replicate. It's meant to be the idea, it's meant to be an electronic or mathematical equivalent, not only of the idea of shuffling, but of the idea of letting everybody watch you shuffle the votes in a traditional ballot box. Okay, so we looked last year at an electronic voting system whose code, source code was made public in Switzerland six months before the Swiss were intending to use it in their election. It was produced by a multinational company called Seitel and resold by Swiss Post for use in Swiss elections. And it had exactly these kind of fancy cryptographic proofs of proper shuffling and proper decryption. Unfortunately, both proofs were buggy. And buggy in this sense means that it was possible to produce a thing that looked like a proof, but in fact allowed the computer or the people who programmed the computer to substitute or change votes and still pass the verification because they could make a proof that looked like it was sound. So this completely breaks the primary purpose of the verifiable election system that they had. And it's really interesting to see what happened in Switzerland as a result of these discoveries. Okay. So uh, just to summarize, a cheating mixing service could duplicate and drop votes and a cheating decrypting service could turn a vote that had actually been validly cast into complete nonsense. And in both cases, they could provide a complete, properly verifying mathematical proof that everything was fine. So here's the interesting bit. The Swiss learned about this problem six months before they were intending to use the system. And they found out about this problem because the Swiss had very good electoral law. And in particular, they have this ordinance, which uh, I've copied here, which says basically that uh, not only does the source code have to be kind of viewable, but it has to be downloadable in a way that anyone can examine, modify, compile, and execute it, muck around with it, examine it, and tell all their friends about it. This turned out to be critically important in the Swiss case. So we got access to this code primarily as a direct result of this ordinance because the, neither the vendor nor Swiss Post were particularly keen to share it, but they didn't really get a choice. Secondly, um, the Swiss electoral law, although I haven't put it on this slide, also contains a large collection of very specific security and privacy and verification requirements. It says, for example, that there have to be sound proofs for exactly this thing that we've just shown to be broken. So the combination of the very precise requirements specified in law 
with the transparency requirement that the actual system had to be open to examination, made it possible for scientists to point to a specific requirement, point to a specific part of the code and say, look, this code doesn't meet this requirement. And, and that was that. So now, what, is, what does all this have to do with New South Wales iVote, right? What was I doing mucking around in Switzerland? Uh, the answer is that the iVote system was purchased by, purchased from the same company. And although the front end of the iVote system is completely different and not verifiable at all, the back end system used the same um, shuffling and decryption proof because they bought it from the same vendor. Right, so I'll, say, I'll spare you the picture of how the New South Wales iVote system works. Su suffice it to say, they didn't put much effort into even pretending that you could verify the results. We knew that this first bug in Swiss Post's shuffle proof affected iVote 2, even though the source code for the iVote system was kept secret. And the reason we know that is that at the time the discovery went public, New South Wales was already using the system for early voting. All right, so here's the first huge contrast, right? Switzerland is having a public examination of a system they're intending to use six months hence. New South Wales is just already using it, having kept it secret right up until the point that the rubber hit the road. So uh, I think Justin Hendry puts it perfectly. New South Wales Electoral Commission confirms iVote contains critical societal crypto defect, but declares that they're just going to use it for the state election anyway. I think that says it all. They did say that uh, the vendor patched it during the election, but of course there was no way for anybody to tell whether it was patched or not. Okay, so that was the first bug. And remember I said we found two bugs, right? And they was, the discovery was separated by uh, a few days, a few weeks actually, a couple of weeks. So what about the bug in the decryption proofs, right? What about the second issue, which allowed a cheating decryptor to, pre to turn a validly cast vote into a nonsense looking vote that wouldn't be counted. Well, it seemed highly likely that this was relevant to New South Wales, but we couldn't prove it because the source code was closed. The Electoral Commission put out this charming little press release saying the New South Wales Electoral Commission is confident that the new issue is not relevant to the iVote system. I was highly skeptical, but I didn't have any way to prove it. At election time, you had to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, which said you weren't going to say anything about what you'd found for five years. Uh, this I refused to sign. Four months after the election, they made the code available under a 45-day non-disclosure agreement. I signed up. It was immediately obvious that, in fact, the bug was present in their code and had been present at election time. So here's the huge difference, right? I said Swiss electoral law not only specify certain important minimum standards, but also mandates transparency of the system and its source code. New South Wales electoral law does exactly the opposite. In fact, you can go to jail for sharing the source code without the electoral commissioner's permission. So it does neither of the two important things that Swiss law does. It does exactly the opposite. It mandates secrecy of the source code and punishes sharing information with other citizens. And it also has basically no meaningful requirements for privacy or verifiability or anything important. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, I'm just going to shift to my, oh, and the decryption proof bug was relevant, which surprised nobody when we actually got a chance to look at it, but by then it was far too late. Okay, so here's the summary. I think verifiable e-voting in a polling place is quite feasible. Over the internet, I think it's an unsolved problem. We just don't know how to do it. You can agree or disagree. But good regulations make a huge difference, right? There's a huge difference between these two different places that were each sold the same broken system. The one with good regulations, serious minimum standards and mandated transparency found out about their problem six months in advance and decided not to use the system. The one with secrecy laws and basically no significant standards ran their broken system right through a state election and didn't even find, didn't find out about it except by sheer good luck after the election. Okay, I'll quit there, but questions are welcome. Okay, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, that would be awesome. Vanessa, and we're back. There we go. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, that was uh, that was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I, uh, um, I, I'm sure you have lots of questions that will people will want to want to give. Just to remind everybody that if you have any questions, can if you could put them in the chat.
that would be great and we can collate them etc at the end so um okay that was so yeah have a think about what you want to do and put them in the chat and we'll sort that out so if we'll now move on to our uh, second uh presenter excuse me i'm just struggling with too many things open there we go uh so is dr uh, julianne molino who as i've already mentioned is a uh, lecturer in um uh, New Zealand politics at uh, AUT and um, she's also a, an expert on uh, e-voting although she's, she's done a report uh, on online voting in, in for about local elections in New Zealand and I think she's going to share some thoughts around that and, and other issues uh, now. So if I hand over to you Vanessa, not Vanessa, sorry Julianne. Thank you, John. Um, just following up from what Vanessa's been talking about, I did like that the inquiry into the New South Wales elections took at face value CITEL's assurances that they'd built security into what they'd done. So rather than saying this is a private company that has an interest in the outcome here, a commercial interest, the fact that they had given assurances that they had covered everything off was, was sufficient for that inquiry, um, which is really not good enough. I think we'll agree. Um, yeah, so as John said, I've got an interest in local government and it was through my interest in local government that I came across the issue of online voting. It's not really my uh, specialty research area, but it looked like we were going to have online voting as an option for some of our council elections last year. And the reason I wrote a report, which is aimed at journalists, uh, people in local government and the general public, so it's not really an academic publication, uh, was to just interrogate some of the arguments that I was coming around, across and some of the comments and claims that people were making around online voting. So I called that report Solving and Creating Problems because people in local government in New Zealand do have genuine problems that they're trying to solve and that they're applying online voting as a solution for those. And we, we need to take those problems very seriously, but online voting then creates its own set of problems. Vanessa's outlined a security issue uh, with using the internet to cast your vote. And in New Zealand, there's been no discussion that I'm aware of that we use machine voting in polling booths. That is people turn up to a polling booth and use a machine. Uh, it's more about people casting their vote from their own device in the convenience and privacy of their own home or at work or wherever they happen to be. So you're using the internet to trans transmit that. Uh, so when we talk about e-voting, that, that term e can cover a whole range of things, but in New Zealand we're talking really about internet voting. So I liked in the description of the seminar the phrase or the question, is e-voting a saviour of democracy or, or a harbinger of doom? Because in the early days of the internet, of course, it was seen very much as having great potential to democratise society, that we would all have access to lots of information, that we would um, be able to hook in from the convenience of our own home into political events and meetings and take part in things, to organise at a grassroots level um, and be, be much more involved. Uh, that view has shifted, that optimism has dimmed, I think, with, with experience. And organisations like Internet New Zealand that used to support online voting are now much more cautious, in particular because of the security uh, issues that Vanessa's raised. So if we look at online voting as a policy issue, which is what I've done, is I just ask some simple questions that we tend to do in policy studies, which is to say, what problem are you trying to solve? And this seems like a really obvious question, but it's one you have to ask because often people are talking at cross purposes trying to solve quite different problems. The next question is, does the solution actually solve them? And online voting may or may not solve some of these problems. In fact, in some cases, it, it doesn't solve them at all. The assumption people make about the convenience, for example, or that young people will become more engaged with politics doesn't hold up when we look at the evidence. And the last question is, what new problems does it create? So that's how I tend to structure my thinking around this issue and also how I've written about it. Uh, but if I just start by saying where things sit in New Zealand, there is a sense of urgency in local government about adopting online voting. There have been two attempts to do it in 2016 and the 2019 elections. And the sense of urgency comes from feeling that the postal voting system that we currently use isn't really fit for purpose anymore and maybe in a couple of elections time we won't even have a postal system that we can use at all. So New Zealand's seen one of the biggest drop-offs in demand for postal services in the world, oh sorry in the OECD. New Zealand Post has cut its infrastructure, it's cut its service, 
what happens in one or two elections time when that's no longer available? How will we organise our local elections? So internet voting is seen as a potential solution to a very real problem that local government's facing. The other thing that comes up commonly when people talk of problems with local elections is around turnout. Turnout's quite low. It's much lower than it is for our parliamentary elections. And it has been falling. So the last three elections, though, it's been in the early 40s. Um, it's just slightly above 40%. And within that average across the country, you get really wide turnout levels from sort of around 60%, but also down closer to 20%. The problem from a democratic point of view with the slow turnout is that these uh, small number of people turning up to vote don't represent the whole of the community in terms of their demographics, their socioeconomic status, their interests, their preferences, and their values. When voter turnout falls in almost all jurisdictions where this has been studied, what happens is some population groups continue voting while others drop out. And so you can end up with quite a distortion in who's voting, and that creates an incentive to um, have a wider representation of people voting. But it also uh, raises questions about the legitimacy of people who win. So if the turnout is only 30%, and it's a first past the post election, and you only won a third of that vote, can you, do you then have a mandate when you're in office to say, I'm doing this, I'm acting on behalf of the community or I'm representing the community's interests? So turnout's a really serious issue that they're uh, interested in as well. So that's where the push comes from for local government. As I said, there were two attempts to introduce online voting. They were both some way down the track before they were called off. In 2016, uh, Internal Affairs was not convinced that there was enough time left so it was called off early in the election year. The election period opens in September. They still hadn't got you know, the software and things up and running by the start of the year. So how, did they really have enough time to test it? In 2019, uh, they got a little bit further down the track. They actually put out a tender asking for companies to provide the software, which would have been an off-the-shelf product, then customised for New Zealand use. And that tender was won by a company called Smartmatic, which Vanessa might want to comment on shortly. I think Saital also put in a bid for that. Um, and the price that came in was about double what the local councils had budgeted for. And so they called it off just on um, not having enough money. Following that, the online working group, so there's a group of officials across councils in New Zealand who really want to see online voting. They said, you know, the only way this is going to happen is if central government steps in. We don't have the money, we don't have the resources. So that's where we're at with local government. In terms of our parliamentary elections, we actually do have an online voting option here. If you're an overseas voter, you have a choice of how you return your papers. So you can turn up to vote in person in a, a New Zealand um, embassy or um, high commission, for example, which is not very convenient if you're in Glasgow and your nearest polling booth is London. So you can return your papers in a variety of ways. You can post them using snail, snail mail, or you can fax them if you can actually access that technology. But in 2014 and 2017, you also had the option of attaching them as an email and sending it to the election commission. This time around, no email, but you can upload them to a, a website that the electoral commission has. So we already have some online voting in New Zealand, although it's restricted to people who are overseas. And what's happened is that since 2014, when it was introduced, it's taken over as the main way in which people overseas vote. And also the number of people voting from overseas has gone up sharply as well. So this adds to the kind of turnout arguments that sometimes get made. So that's where we're at at the moment. Um, don't want to run through all the problems and whether or not online voting solves them because that's that's a longer and, and different presentation. But if we look at the new problems, in addition to security, I think we also have to ask a question about equality. So when we talk about online voting being convenient, whose convenience are we talking about? We have a digital divide in New Zealand. We have differences in digital literacy. We also have an issue of digital poverty. And unless you maintain a paper ballot alongside your online ballot, and unless you make the paper ballot easy to access and you remove barriers for people participating that way, you run the risk of disenfranchising a chunk of your population. And the people you run the risk of disenfranchising are the people who tend not to vote anyway, tend not to have their voices heard. So it's people with um, lower levels of education, lower levels of income, 
more likely to live in neighbourhoods with higher levels of deprivation. We also know that for example, from Census 2018, that the group that didn't participate in the online census disproportionately was Māori. So we have to be really careful when we think about online civic activities as being convenient, as to convenient for who. So at the moment, we already have great disparities in who votes, particularly in our local elections, and we run the risk of exacerbating that inequality. It's homeowners, it's people with more income, people with more wealth who are already voting. Are we just making it convenient for them and not really putting our creative energies and our, and our fun funding into how we help the turnout for people living in um, you know, higher deprivation neighbourhoods? So I think that's all I'll say now, but happy to take questions about this. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Julianne, sorry. I keep yeah, right. mispronouncing your name for some reason. My apologies. Um, that, that, was, that was excellent. I was really interested in your comment at the end about the assumptions about uh, who we're making it convenient for. So we'll maybe explore that explore that later. We've had similar things happen at universities. Um, so uh, that was uh, fantastic. And uh, we'll move on. And again, just a reminder, if you have any thoughts or questions you want to ask, if you put them in the chat, I will um, refer to that at the end and, uh, and ask them on out loud so that it gets recorded for the video. Um, so, uh, without further ado, we'll move on to our final uh, panelist this morning, who is uh, Graham Edgeler. Um, and Graham is a um, barrister in uh, at uh, from uh, Wellington. Probably enjoying lovely weather at the moment, if, if what, what the news is uh, telling me is correct. And uh, um, as an expert in electoral law and will take us from the, the practitioner standpoint. So Graham, I'll hand over to you and you can introduce your uh, topic in a little bit more detail. Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's been helpful that Julian uh, described some of those things. It saves some of the things I, I had sort of covered off, which it makes a lot of sense because there is a lot of crossover between the uh, uh, political and the legal aspects of this. Um, I mean, there really isn't a lot to say, I don't think, about, sorry, uh, there really isn't a lot to say, I think, about um, about the legal aspects of this. This isn't a legal problem. Um, if you, if the people who are good at the technology can come up with a good way of doing it, the law can follow relatively quickly. Um, it's not something, you know, there are things which are hard for the law to solve um, and technology issues are one of them. If you solve the technology issues, um, the law can catch up in this area relatively quickly, I think. As Julian noted, um, we have, in fact, a couple of laws already which allow for electronic voting, um, principally the Local Electoral Act, which governs local elections in New Zealand. Um, but what it's done is, is very simple. It's got basically a couple of sections saying you can have electronic voting. And in those sections where we refer to voting papers, that can mean electronic voting papers. Um, but it's left all the detail, unfortunately, to uh, the government to have regulations. and um, um, we have not yet worked out a way of having good regulations um, that would uh, that would actually solve the problems we want to solve and not create problems we can't uh, then fix themselves. So um, this is something that could happen in, in local bodies uh, relatively simply um, if the technology and the political will was there. Um, and I think there is a problem. The problem is if, if you are someone who wants electronic voting, uh, for everyone. Um, it's it's a technology problem and you know it's one of those weird things where I, I've noted it's people who work in the area and who could make a lot of money out of selling electronic voting are the people who seem to for the most part uh, be the strongest opponents of it because they know what the problems are. Um, for national elections that is if we were to move to electronic voting and that could include electronic voting even in, in a voting booth um, that's a lot harder from a from a legal and political perspective. Um, there are very few sections of the Electoral Act uh, which are the reserved sections. So these are the important ones which you need a 75% majority of Parliament to vote to change. Uh, one of them is the secret ballot on paper. Um, there, there are only sort of half a dozen of them, and paper ballots with you know secret voting uh, is up there. So this is not something from a political perspective that uh, one government can run on and then um, have, you know, oh, we're going to introduce it, you know, because we've got a mandate to do it. It's going to need uh, strong buy-in 
um, from from all sides, I think. And I think uh, for it's quite some time away for national elections, and it would be something that you would want to probably, right. and I suspect this is the experience overseas, um, trial in local elections first. Uh, and once the problems with local elections um, have been solved, only then would it ever uh, move to, to national elections. Uh, in part in New Zealand, um, and I think that's another reason that's likely is given we have a strong national government and weak local governments, uh, unfortunately, uh, local governments are just a lot less important. And so if something wrong did happen, um, people would care less, um, but we would care a great deal if something went wrong with a national election. Um, as, as Julian noted, um, there is some uh, prospect of electronic voting in some form uh, for general elections as alternative ways of, of voting. And so principally for people overseas, um, but we have a number of electronic forms of voting, um, not necessarily internet, uh, that have been created. We have uh, telephone dictation voting, um, which is uh, principally used by the deaf community, sorry, the blind community um, in New Zealand. A and it brings me to sort of the one aspect that me being both an electoral lawyer and sometime human rights lawyer um, sees, you know, I'm concerned about electronic voting, but it has a, a distinct uh, value for people who cannot cast paper ballots. And, and so um, I suspect none of you have seen it, but after every election and after every local election, um, the Justice Committee at Parliament holds a, a review of what happened, what changes should we recommend. Uh, and at the last couple of reviews, we have had people from the blind community uh, giving evidence, and it's I, you know, I really love democracy, and you know, I'm you know, someone who's telling you I've voted in the last, you know, for the last 30 years, and this was the first election I ever got to cast a secret ballot, that no one knew who I was voting for, and it's just exceptionally empowering, and it's something we should encourage. And so, if there are technical issues um, with bringing it out for everyone else. Um, then for certain communities, um, from a non-discrimination perspective, there are distinct benefits in allowing those communities to be able to cast electronic votes in some form. And that's, I think, that is something that is important, that something that the rest of the community takes for granted, the ability to go and tick two boxes, or at this election, potentially four boxes, um, and put it in somewhere, and no one knows who you voted for. And for a, for a an important and probably growing sector of the community. Um, that is not something um, that is possible for them. Um, and it is good from a legal perspective that we are um, decreasing the barriers to vote. Um, um, as I think I said at the beginning, you know, the law here, you know, it's, it's a distinction lawyers make between law and regulation. Um, you know, the ideas, you know, what we need to put in the law is important. You know, that section in the Swiss law sounds vastly better than the section in the New South Wales law to me, uh, as a, someone who's not knowing a great deal about technology, but it was followed this occasionally um, when it's hit the news and, you know, people in tech was like, yes, we need to be able to see and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, both of those looked perfectly sensibly drafted bits of law. You know, we understand what both of them mean and they both apply and lawyers can you know, go to court and know exactly what they mean. And, and that's the legal answer to the question because it isn't a legal problem. Um, and so uh, I don't know that there is a great deal that a lawyer can bring to this. Um, what we really need is what are the ideas and what are the um, problems? And potentially if there are too many problems, recognizing that this isn't something that is going to happen for some time. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, other countries will sort some of the problems before we have to. Um, and the uh, thing Julian mentioned, you know, at the end with um, the problems potentially of local body elections, um, the local electoral act, in fact, allows three ways to vote. Um, one of them, electronic voting needs regulations which aren't in force yet, so that can't happen until those those are in force. Um, there is postal ballot, and it is up to each local body. They can just conduct booth voting. Um, I am not old enough to remember booth voting for local body elections, um, but it very much used to happen. Um, when postal voting came in, uh, turnout went up, you know, briefly, 
not by a lot, um, I suspect it arrested for three or six or nine years what was a, a slowly um, decreasing number of people who were voting. Um, it went up and now we're just back to decreasing from the, the level we were before. Um, but I have, I think, the concerns that a lot of the others from a political perspective or a technological perspective have expressed. Um, this isn't something lawyers can solve for you. There are things we can do. Um, unfortunately, this really isn't one of them. And thank you. Thanks, Graham. Controversial statement that this is not a legal problem. I might take you up on that later. Um, uh, uh, what is law? Anyway, uh, <laughs> we can discuss that later. Uh, but I don't want to monopolize everybody's time. So um, that was a really interesting comments. I'm sorry, my computer has gone mental and is binging in the background constantly. I apologize for that. Uh, the notifications. Um, so uh, what I suggest we do, so um, I think I'm going to actually move to some of the questions in the chat rather than, and then we can then have a, a panel discussion based on those rather than me uh, necessarily sort of spark off my own, I'll maybe ask some questions at the end. So um, a couple of um, things have arisen, uh, well several sort of similar themes have arisen. Um, the, the, one of the issues that seems to strike me is whether the is with what, what, what are we talking about here? Because there's quite a lot of different e-voting systems that we could be dealing with. So I suppose, um, is there any evidence, um, as Vernon asked, about um, uh, error between manual and, manual and electronic systems of the different types that you mentioned? Because we've talked about electronic systems having a problem and Vanessa mentioned the code version issue there. Is there what sort of work is there on comparing manual um, systems with, with e-systems. Um, if I could just say something there. So we've got different ways of voting, whether you turn up in person and vote uh, at a polling booth, which is what we're about to do with our New Zealand elections. Uh, there's postal voting and, and online voting. And once you get to e-voting, there are then different kinds of systems that you use as well. So whether you're using the internet or whether you're just using an electronic machine, whether you're casting your vote on paper, which then gets read by a machine, or whether you're casting your vote directly onto a machine and have no receipt of, of that ballot. Um, but where, however you design your voting system, there will be security weaknesses and you design it anticipating certain problems and also doing trade-offs. So when it comes to voting in person at a polling booth, our electoral, our electoral commission has decided to make voting as widely accessible as they can, to um, not create barriers for people. So you don't have to show up with photo ID. You know, you can just turn up and give your name uh, and that opens up the potential for impersonation. If I knew my neighbour was definitely not going to vote, I could, and I knew her name, I could go to a different polling booth to mine and I could cast a vote in her name. And so long as no one in that polling station knew who I was, I could get away with that. Um, the thing there is that that's a very hard fraud to scale up. It's very hard to scale up to the point where you change the outcome of an election. And you're also counting on the fact that you don't get caught because you have to be there in person to do it. Likewise with postal voting, um, we have a lot of anecdotal stories, people saying my ballot never turned up, for example, and we don't know actually what's happened to those ballots. We don't know whether New Zealand Post failed to deliver them, whether they were delivered but they just got thrown out with all the junk mail, whether they got delivered but were then stolen, or whether they got delivered but someone else in the household handled them. We, we, we don't know, there is no evidence. But there doesn't appear to be any evidence of widespread theft of ballots from mailboxes. So if you were wanting to rig an election and it was a postal one, again, you have to be on the ground, you have to be physically present, you would have to steal a lot of ballots and hope no one reported their ballot stolen. Because when you put your ballot in, of course, it will be they will have a barcode that's tied back to that person who's reported it stolen. So we don't have any evidence that that's going on, but it's quite, again, it's quite hard to scale up a level of fraud to the extent that you would impact on the outcome. And Vanessa can talk about the issues with online voting, but my understanding is that it can be hard to detect, but also it could be easy to scale up and it could come from anywhere in the world. So rather than someone being physically present, it could come from offshore. And New Zealand shouldn't assume that they're not going to be a target of offshore actors in the sense, if we buy off the shelf software, 
that is being used in other countries, a hacker might actually try and hack a New Zealand local election to try out their skills when their real target is somewhere else. So we shouldn't assume that we're too small or we're too distant for this to be um, an issue. But Vanessa can talk about the why people care so much about security um, for online voting. But to answer Vernon, there actually isn't a lot of evidence that we have much fraud taking place with either postal or in-person voting in New Zealand. Thanks, uh, Julian. Before I hand over to Vanessa, yes, I think the, I'll just, because I do work on anti-corruption, the point you make about us being too small, you should never think that because uh, our budgets actually, you know, it's quite a lot of money there that a company could uh, make off a contract here or there. So we shouldn't, yeah. yeah. There There's a lot of money at stake in local government decisions. Exactly. Uh, we, we might not take uh, local government very seriously, right. but whether or not there's a change to zoning, that's which right. enables people to make yeah. a lot of money out of land development or that's removes right. that possibility, uh, actually could provide quite a strong incentive yeah. for someone to try and rig an election. Exactly. There, there are reasons, yes, absolutely. Anyway, Vanessa, so maybe I'll turn to you. And also you might want to comment on the differences in approach in the Swiss and the uh, New South Wales um, systems, like why why have one being so secret and one having the public uh, public access to the code, uh, particularly from a from an, a cryptologist's point of view? Um, I 100% agree with everything that Julian just said. Uh, I think it's not that poll site voting is perfectly secure or postal voting is perfectly secure. It's that the scale of manipulation that is undetectable potentially by a very, very small conspiracy of people uh, is potentially hugely greater for an electronic system. So many of the same attacks, but vastly more scalable and much harder to detect. Uh, and I would also add it's about the fragility of the evidence trail too. So if you've got a great big pile of paper ballots in a polling place and there's some kind of a dispute or somebody raises a problem and demands a recount or whatever, then that there's evidence that can be used as the basis for the discussion. Whereas if everything has come over the an electronic system and there's a dispute about whether that was okay, then you don't necessarily have a ground truth to argue about in the case of a uh, dispute. So um, I just completely agree with everything that Julian just said. Um, in the, as to the question of why there are different approaches in the different countries between Switzerland and New South Wales, I honestly do not know. I do not understand this crazy Australian thing with keeping stuff secret in the hope that that makes it secure. It's just a complete misconception about what makes things secure, right? And if you ask them, why are you keeping this secret, sir? If you showed it to me, I could help you find some bugs. I get this kind of crazy nonsense about how they've had it certified perfectly correct by a bunch of authority figures. Uh, we have found, quite, quite separate from the security problems we found in iVote, we found counting problems in the New South Wales STV count, which is quite a complex counting process. They still wouldn't show us the code, even after we'd found a serious bug that caused them to get very highly likely the wrong answer in at least one local government election. Instead, after we'd found a bug, they ran us this long story about how they'd had it certified perfectly correct by a completely trustworthy authority. We showed them the bug in their counting transcript. They said, oh, oh, you're right. We fixed that now and we've got it recertified perfectly correct by the same authority. Then we found another bug. No, note that we haven't seen any of the source code at this point. We're just looking at the counting transcripts. Then they went back and got it re-recertified by the same authority figures that it certified it perfectly correct twice, even though it was broken. I just don't understand the logic, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. You don't have to know anything about computer science to know that if the certification process has been demonstrably broken twice, then showing it to the people who have found and got two errors fixed in an open way is more likely to fix bugs than keeping it secret and going back and getting it certified again by the same people who fouled up three times. But I just cannot understand this attitude at all. And yet we see it again and again. If you look at the, so there are elections now in the Australian Capital Territory, which historically has had an open system. This year they've decided to substitute a closed source system. And there's a big group at the ANU that have found a series of bugs in the ACT's counting code over many years, the ACT Electoral Commission hasn't shown them their new counting code. They've just kind of hacked it up on the quiet, 
they're running us this story about how they've got it perfect, you know, certified perfectly correct by somebody they chose. It's almost as if they just don't understand what code is and how to make it correct and secure. I don't know. That was a long answer to say you don't know, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, stupid. It's okay. I'm writing that down. It's just stupid. Um, in in terms of uh, um, Vernon asked the the B word. He said the B word. He asked, um, uh, "What about blockchain?" Okay, okay. I'll take the <laughs> "What about blockchain?" question. Because <laughs> I know one of our. I don't know if Alex is on. Alex is on. Blockchain's the answer to everything. So. Um, uh, I know a little bit about blockchain, but, but Vernon says it hurts his head. So yes. um, <laughs> um, perhaps it does, it does, the, does the security aspects of blockchain, obviously the, the fact that you can't change the chain, does that, does that provide a, a solution here or is, is there a role for it? Okay, well, speaking as a computer scientist, I actually did my PhD thesis on distributed consensus protocols 20 years ago before it was cool. So uh, two things. First of all, it doesn't solve the problem. Second of all, it isn't impossible to change the contents of the blockchain, right? So that's a security property of a cryptographic system. If you actually look at who controls the computational power of things like Bitcoin, for example, even the really big ones, you see that although in principle, it's a distributed consensus protocol that's spread around the world, in practice, three big Chinese mining pools control the overwhelming majority of the computational power. Right? So it's not impossible. It's just hard for anybody with less than a majority of computational power. So think about whether your you know, planning decision or uh, electoral outcome is more or less important than um, the expense needed to fiddle the contents of the blockchain because it's, fi it's finite, right? It's not impossible, it's just expensive. Uh, and then the second point is it doesn't actually change. If you, you go back to my picture, think about my picture of all the different steps at which you'd want to prove all the different important things about an election. The blockchain doesn't solve the problem of whether your computer is accurately recording your vote before you upload it. It does to some extent contribute to the possibility of us all being able to look at an agreed list of encrypted votes, right? So it, it could potentially have a role at that point. It doesn't solve the problem of whether the people shuffling and decrypting the votes have done it honestly. You still need some other solution for that problem. And it doesn't solve any of the issues around uh, equity or uh, fairness or participation that Julian and others have been raising. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I've, I've got another related question to that, but on the grounds of fairness, I'm going to go move out and then we'll maybe come back to you. All right, that, that issue is obviously sparked some interest. Um, so what about the, so it strikes me we're, we're coming from the assumption that e-voting is something we want to explore, but it struck me that this relates a little bit to what Julianne said, and we've got some questions about this, that what's the, what's the, what's the problem, we're what's the mischief we're trying to solve here? And uh, I suppose you can see it from two sides. So what, there's the issue, as, as um, has been said in the chat, can actually be used as a, a suppression method, uh, or it's allegedly been used, in the, particularly in the US, uh, around the use of electronics um, machines, um, as well as uh, alongside the idea of it, like more people voting. But as Julian pointed out, and I hadn't really thought about that myself, to be honest, there is an issue there about who actually would use this e-voting. Um, and then that may relate to Graham's point about whether this is a legal issue or not. Could you, is it not, is it not a legal framework you have to put in place to ensure that it's fair if, if, if you're moving towards this thing? Anyway, that's a lot of ideas. Does anybody, I'm trying to link them together. Who wants to dive in? Uh, I'll come in at the beginning, I think. There's certainly, you, you have to do, have to put in a legal framework to ensure it's fair. I just don't think that legal framework is particularly difficult. And as long as you've got sort of good oversight by the courts and things like that, um, you know, either before elections or after them, um, those sorts of problems are things that hopefully can be solved. Um, you know, if there's a problem with the counting software, I don't know if, you know, I know uh, I did a, a recount um, last year for the local body elections where we were strongly confirmed like we've had that we've had our counting system tested and i don't know if it's the same one that uh, vanessa has been talking about that would be interesting um to know um but it's i think um this thing we're trying to solve is voter turnout and 
Um, that's a problem in local body elections. Um, as much as people are concerned about declining voter turnout at general elections, New Zealand has one of the highest voting turnouts in the world. Australia with compulsory voting and other countries with compulsory voting have higher turnouts. Uh, New Zealand is still really, really high. And so for the types of problems you have, you know, there are at every election uh, a few people who vote twice. Um, sometimes it's by mistake. You know, they uploaded their voting paper online and then they posted it in. And that's dual voting and their vote will not count. Uh, sometimes it's a few of the instances uh, um, a, a polling clerk has gone to a, say a, a retirement home and helped everyone their vote and then on election day itself um, someone's kids have come up and turned come on come on mum we'll go to the voting place and they find these votes and so um, the systems we have for that are good and I'm not sure it's going to be you know an easily solved problem as I think everyone said um, to, to fix those types of things um, the electronic voting um, so that we can actually be happy with, with what's going on there. But it's voter turnout. And for general elections, that's not a problem, really. Um, I'd echo yeah. what Graham says yeah. there. I think particularly for our parliamentary elections, the Electoral Commission does a really good job at making elections accessible, everything from the long advance voting period through to this time around where there's been some concerns about COVID-19 and social distancing and the safety of turning up to a polling booth, uh, you can register to do a postal vote. So um, I think they go out of their way to make elections, to design elections well. Um, one of my advanced polling booths has just said they're opening at 6am to catch commuters, you know, so we, we go out of our way to accommodate people and their lifestyles. Vernon's question was about voter suppression in the US. Uh, I just, that's just not an issue in New Zealand, I think, from a design point of view, when it comes to parliamentary elections. For local elections, it's a little bit more of an issue where perhaps not everybody has um, the same access to a postal system, particularly younger people, uh, just have never used it perhaps in their entire life. Finding a box to send your papers back can be very difficult when New Zealand Post restructures their location and reduces their location. Um, in 2016 election, they actually reduced the number of uh, post boxes during the election period. They removed some. So um, you can look at that design and say it's not as convenient. But generally speaking, I'd say we don't have an issue with voter suppression in New Zealand. Um, maybe I can follow up on that, because I think you're right, Julian. Of course, we don't at the moment. Um, however, I think these things can emerge. Uh, the other point would say, I would say is, what, what about it being by, by accident rather than design? Because as you pointed out there, the, the voting young people don't, don't use uh, post services. Um, but then you said you did make the point about some of the, the, the least enfranchised parts of the country. Because that's the point, of course, isn't that parts of the country don't vote. And parts of the population don't vote. Uh, so um, could, is there a role for uh, electronic systems re resolving this? Or is that a red herring? It's a little bit of a red herring in that for people to vote, they have to be engaged. So if you've got a population who are disengaged for whatever reason, just sticking a ballot on a screen doesn't create an engagement. And that's what they've found with the use of online voting overseas is that it doesn't actually increase the participation of young people at all. In fact, we're in those jurisdictions where they've got a choice between an online vote or turning up in person on election day to cast a vote, it's young people who disproportionately turn up in person on election day. And it's people who are a little bit older who tend to like the online voting, people more in their 40s, 30s and 40s. So the youngest voters, um, it doesn't do anything to create engagement. It doesn't do anything to create confidence. Um, the kinds of issues that young people might have around voting. So, so in terms of that works, I, do, I don't know anything about it. Um, is it, when you talk about electronic, is it, can you vote on a phone, for example? One of the issues that we have here is that students, their electronic device is often a phone. It's not yep. a computer. So we provide them with this information and unfortunately they're using it on a tiny wee screen. Um, so I wondered, um, is, I don't, I've no, I don't know, can you maybe comment on that? 
Um, yeah, I think just because something's on a screen doesn't mean people are going to engage with it. Uh, my local council live streams its meetings on Facebook, but if you tune in, you know, the 1.6 million Aucklanders aren't watching the meetings on Facebook. There's maybe a dozen people watching it. Just because it's there doesn't mean people will take advantage of it because of the technology. So mm. you have to create the engagement first, and then you have to make sure that the voting system is convenient, but engagement comes first. So when we're looking at groups who are disaffected um, or who perhaps don't have confidence about voting or don't feel that they have the information they need, those are the problems we actually need to solve first. Okay, thanks, Julian. Awesome. Um, so we're, we're nearly out of time, but I noticed there's a number of questions all looking and talking about Vanessa's coding issues. So I'll maybe come back to you, Vanessa. Um, so um, a couple of questions about the, the idea of the open source code, um, whether that's a risk, um, because, um, you know, can, people can then see how to, to break, to, to, you know, sorry, I'm long time since I did coding, um, to, break, to break the system. Um, um, is, is, that, is that a risk or not? I mean, yes, but not as big as the, in my opinion, not as big as the gain from the opportunity that uh, people who will fix the bugs can see the bugs. So of course it's a trade-off. I think the real secrecy of the code is probably greatly overrated, right? And I, I think one thing, one thing the Swiss, Swiss New Zealand example demonstrates is New South Wales tried really hard to keep it secret, but they couldn't keep it secret because the same thing was being sold to a different country that made it public, right? So even if you wanted secrecy, which I don't think you do, uh, you can't get secrecy unless you're absolutely certain that you've got this really special little cabal of people who are the only people who ever see that code. So I think you can't actually keep it secret. So you might as well have a good process for examining it in public. I don't think it would help much to keep it secret, to be honest. I think that, uh, uh, for example, you know, we found bugs in stuff for which we couldn't see the code. It just takes a bit longer and it's a bit harder to figure out, right? The, the people who are going to try to exploit it maliciously are also likely to be able to find bugs without seeing the code. It just takes a bit longer. So it's a balance, but I think overall, in my opinion, especially for election software that a lot of members of the general public care about, I think the balance is strongly in favour of making it open and inviting examination and trying to get good people engaged in fixing it for you. Graham commented in the um, chat that open code for local body systems hasn't been a requirement um, and for the 2019 proposal they explicitly look the local government officials explicitly said they would not be making that public because they were concerned it would make the hacking of the system easier they did help hold some consultations with uh, members of the community including um, software specialists it specialists but they commented it was very difficult to really examine what was being talked about because the public discussions were at a very high level. So they never got to see the code, they never got to see the detail, and there was a level of secrecy uh, taken in that. Yeah. I, I think in practice they hide stuff because they know it's bad, and they know that if the public could see how bad it was, they wouldn't trust it. Well, thank you. We're almost out of time. So thank you all for your um, comments. I was going to finish off. Graeme, did you, I'll finish off with you, Graeme. Did you think uh, that we would move to a, a closed or an open system? I saw the comment in the chat in relation to that. Um, I don't think we would move to an open system unless someone really put it on the, on, on, you know, I could imagine a couple of MPs, you know, one MP getting a, a, a member's bill could, could make that an issue and then we'd do it forever. Um, but it's not going to be something that the government is probably going to do. We, I don't think we'll do the reverse. Um, you know, it won't be a crime to share the code, um, but the code won't be public either. Sure. On, on what, from what Vienna, uh, Vanessa has just said is uh, probably a very bad idea. Vanessa, you need to put a submission in to uh, sort this <laughs> out. Um, okay, I think, uh, Julian, sorry, did you want to... Oh, I was just going to say, interestingly, at the Justice Select Committee's inquiry into the local body elections, the GCSB made a submission in which they said they don't think that online voting is a good idea for local elections. They um, weren't confident that there was the skill base there to, to manage it properly, and they also had concerns about foreign interference. So I think at a local level, until that, you know, the concern of the GCSB can be addressed, it's, it, it might not happen. I, I, I had a suspicion that it's local election 
uh, the running of local elections has been a concern at various different councils for a long time. That one thing we might have to do before we can do anything like this is remove the administration of local body elections from local bodies. Have a bigger electoral commission. You know, they do general elections every three years and then another of those three years, they run the local elections as well. They run the, um, the local election enrollment. Uh, they don't run local elections. Uh, and I think a lot of people in local bodies uh, and a lot of the public and other politicians would much prefer that the Electoral Commission ran all of our elections, um, not just the general elections and referendums that they do currently. Yeah, it would be a great idea if they did. And that's, that's another debate. It is. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, on the under-resourcing of our Electoral Commission. Okay, so on that, I will hand back to Wayne. Thank you very much for your comments and the comments on the chat and from the excellent uh, contributions from the panelists. You know, really interesting um, discussion. So just to close this up, I'll hand back to Wayne and uh, thank you. Good sure, everyone. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you to all um, the participants uh, for an awesome discussion. Um, really enjoyed it and uh, it'll make a a valuable addition to the Talens, um webinars. Thanks, John, and thanks all the speakers. Cheers. Thank you. More likely to live in neighbourhoods with high levels of deprivation. <laughs>